on this episode Boom. on the ramparts i walk learning all there is to know about the birth of our national anthem francis scott key seasons like yeah and never to argue with ranger vince the war of 1812 was tough going to the moon was tough when have we americans ever shot away from something because it's tough And Dahlia will boast, but of ten and less shades, and the bar. I love the original words to our national anthem. I love the fact that this tune was originally an old English song called To Anacreon in Heaven. I love the fact that Francis Scott Key changed the words as he watched the British retreats during the Battle of Baltimore. And I love the fact that one man is on a mission to make sure people understand the events of 1814 were no less important to the future of America than the shot heard round the world. That man is Ranger Vince Vase. Ranger Vince is a man on a mission. And if he can't get you excited about American history, well, you're either sleeping or not from my hometown. Here we are in Fort McHenry. There are the stars and stripes, snapping proudly in the breeze. In mere moments, we're gonna go inside, we're gonna meet Vince, we're gonna get a tour. I'm told this guy is a pistol. Last time I was here was 1971, I think. I arrived on a bus just like that, except it didn't say Allegheny County Public Schools, it said Baltimore Public Schools. And uh, so now I'm going back into the fort, taking a field trip, you come too. The facts of what happened here 200 years ago haven't changed since my last visit. But the challenge of making history interesting for today's viewer is what you might call quixotic. Nice. But it's worth a try, Buddhist. and my producer Ted is all about making the effort. It's like the old report card. I don't know, when you were in high school, did you get two grades? Did, did you get like a... Uh, an, the effort thing? Yeah. I did, yeah, we're the same age, so yeah. Okay, so you, got, you would get like a B for effort, yeah. C for work, right. or an A for effort, A for work, whatever. Right. This segment, I feel like, is gonna be an A for effort. A lot of effort, and you know, Results, you know, that's that's the very Buddhist thing. It's not about attachment to results. I hadn't thought of it in terms of Buddhism before. I, I think of everything in terms of Buddhism. It's, it's Are you help. a Buddhist? No. Fundamentally, all history is a story. And if we have any hope at all of keeping you awake, we need a good storyteller. Thankfully, Ranger Vince is a pro, and the history of Fort McHenry is one he's told before. That's the original structure where it happened. I mean, what you're looking at is over 200 years old. So if you were here 200 years ago, you would see the rockets red glare coming over. You would see the bombs bursting in air. This well, is where it happened. It, yeah. It still gets me. And, I, and, and uh -huh. you must think about it every day. What, what was it? What was it really like? What was it really, really like? One of the neat things uh, that I like doing is reading the original letters of the soldiers who were here. And these have survived, you know, yeah. from the early 19th century. And those give you a sense of what it was like to be here. For example, one captain who was in the fort, uh, his name was Joseph Nicholson, and he said, we felt like pigeons tied by the legs to be shot at. <laughs> you know, that abject feeling of helplessness, sure. like, you know, they're, they're hitting us, and there's nothing we can do about it. Yeah. You know, that, that sinking Just waiting, feeling. waiting. Just waiting. You're taking it, you know, without being able to give it. Ah. In terms of the construction of the fort, mm -hmm. is it five-sided, basically? Or? Yeah, it's a pentagon. The points that come off of it, the dominant-like protrusions, are called bastions. Mm -hmm. So if you hear, ever hear that term, the last bastion of defense, that's what they're talking about. Right. The other thing is, if you look, see the brick wall? Another name for the wall is called rampart. So when you sing, or the ramparts we watched, Francis Scott Key is on a ship looking up at the wall. He looks above the wall, boom, he sees the big flag. My enthusiastic guide is Ranger Vince Vays, a man who was born to make history come alive. How long have you been here? I've been here 20 years. I started uh, in high school. My high school history teacher was a summer ranger. And he said, hey, would you like to volunteer? And I said, yeah. And he said, I said, well, what do you do? He goes, well, uh, you can portray a young recruit and just loved it ever since. I'm, I, I'm gonna ask you the dumbest question I've ever asked anybody on camera. Uh, on a scale of one to 10, how much do you like what you do? 25. There we go. Let's go up the rampart. Let's do that. We are now coming up on top of the rampart. Uh -huh. What we're doing, looking out over the Patapsco River, September 11th, 1814, 55 British ships were spied down there. This was all part of this War of 1812, a war that hadn't been going well at all. Just how badly was the War of 1812 going? Well, the British had just overrun Washington, D.C., where they burned and looted the White House, the Capitol, the Treasury, and the War Department buildings. 
that badly. The British were bullying us around. You know, they were stealing our sailors off our ships. Right. They were telling us who we could and could not trade with. We tried to negotiate it. We tried embargoes, kind of like economic sanctions. We had the revolution. We already became independent, and that was what we were mad about. It was like, hey, you know, we've moved out of the house. We can turn our stereo up. You don't tell us what to do anymore. Right. So we said, you know what? We're declaring war on them. We put up with it for 10 years. They impressed over 6,000 Americans into the British Navy. We're declaring war to make a stand. A lot of Americans opposed it. Francis Scott Key opposed the War of 1812. What was Key's role in the government? He was not an elected official. Professionally, he was a lawyer from Georgetown, all right? On the night of the 24th of August, 1814, a soldier standing where you are at, looking there, could see a glow in the sky when the British burned the White House and Congress and the government buildings. Unbelievable. The day after, the British marched out of Washington, D.C. Yeah. Then as they were marching through a town called Upper Marlboro, yep. a few British stragglers got away, kind of from the main column, and started breaking into chicken coops and stuff like that and yeah. creating mayhem. And a local elderly guy, he's like 75 years old, his doctor, Dr. William Beans, took two of them prisoner, like shotgun point, you know? <laughs> and uh, I'm just, you can't make this up. And uh, one of them, one of the British soldiers managed to escape uh -huh. and then ratted him out, went to the British high command and said, hey, there's this crazy old man, he's taking guys prisoner. Right. And the British got really mad about it. Dr. William Beans, he was a civilian guy, was taken prisoner by the British. And then President Madison said, hey, this is not cool, taking civilians prisoner. So he, No, no, hold on. I want to imagine James Madison saying, hey, this is not cool. Yeah. Taking taking our people prisoner. Yeah. I just want to see that. He was more eloquent when he wrote the Constitution. Hard to imagine. Yeah. So Key volunteers to negotiate the release of Beans and sails out to the British fleet where Beans is being held. Key succeeds, but there's a catch. So they get this guy off, but the British say, if we let you go ahead of us, you're just going to say everything. You're going to tell them how many ships we got, how many troops we got. Yeah, why wouldn't you? And uh, so you're going to have to wait until this battle is over with. So uh, you just got yourselves a front row seat to the turning point of the War of 1812. The uh, main British squadron is on the horizon. Yeah. Fifteen ships come just beyond that, that green buoy out there. Wait, wait you say buoy? Buoy. Is that like a buoy? Boy. Yeah, you said, that. You said buoy. Buoy, buoy, hein. It's Balmer, it's a buoy, all right? Those ships could fire a throw about a 200 pound exploding shell, a little bigger than the average basketball, two miles. And I say shell because it was packed with 13 pounds of high explosive black powder with a fuse tapped into the top. Boom, when you shot it off, the recoil was so much the whole ship went down two feet and then you could see the black dot go in the air and oh. go a mile high in the sky and then arc down, come down, come down, come down. And when, if you timed it right, when it's rooftop high, the fuse is burnt to the inside where the powder is and, and boom. So devastation there you know, cause they're, they're, the, the goal is, hey, if you think you can take the might of the British Empire, we're going to devastate your cities. Right. Then it starts to rain. So or you can armistice like, great, now it's raining. I got to take the big flag down. Could be worse. Could be raining. Yeah. There were two direct hits right on this very spot. Is that uh, why there's a plaque there? Yeah, this is the more somber part of the park. I always try to make visitors aware that there were people who died here, uh, and two of them died right on this spot. So you have uh, Levi Claggett and Sergeant John Clem, two men uh, of this particular unit, uh, the Baltimore fence, well, local guy who died right on the spot. And then that's the other shell coming in that's going to burst. Then there was another casualty nearby, not far from here, interestingly enough, in a ditch behind the fort, and he was born enslaved. He was a slave. His born name was Frederick Hall. He escaped, joined the American army under a new name called William Williams, and his right leg was severed by a British shell that burst near him. So here you have this Lieutenant Levi Claggett, very prominent Baltimorean, an officer. His name is on a monument in the city of Baltimore right now as we speak. And then over there is Private William Williams, one of the poorest guys of the young republic at that time. Uh, officially, uh, not even considered a citizen by the very country he died defending. And I think it just shows that cross-section of America that came together to defend this sport. Five dead, 25 wounded. Not the bloodiest battle of the war, but a turning point, and Francis Scott Key knew the stakes. If the fort doesn't hold, mm -hmm. what, what logically 
happens next. It's like kicking over the first domino of a series. If the fort doesn't hold, then the British can land. If the British land, then they can march right into the city. Yeah. This was the linchpin of the defense system. Pull the linchpin out, everything falls everything apart. Crumbles. So the bombardment's continuing, right. and then all through the night, Francis Scott Key probably couldn't see the flag, but by dawn's early light, the bombardment, the shelling gradually tapers off. The seemingly invincible armada had been turned away. Yeah. And as, as the British are sailing away, Armistead, the commander of the fort, Major George Armistead, gives them a special send-off. He gives the orders to change the flag. So the small sopping wet flag comes down, the gigantic 30 by 42 foot flag is always to kind of like an in-your-face sure. kind of thing to the British as the fifes and drums of the garrison played Yankee Doodle. And that's when, well, that was our, that was our national That was it. It wasn't official, but it was used like a national anthem. And that's when Francis Scott Key seasons like, yeah, and having that yes moment is really what drove that power of emotion for him to start writing the words that became our country's song. And it's interesting, you know, the history you know and the history you don't know. Uh, you could <laughs> fill a book with what I don't know. <laughs> So I'm here at Fort McHenry, the linchpin of the War of 1812 and the birthplace of our Star Spangled Banner. The Star Spangled Banner has four verses. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of times we only sing the first verse, but the other three verses are like you're with him and he's telling you the story, you know? And it's heavy. I remember, like, oh, thus be an end Ever. where free men shall stand. Between their loved homes and the war's desolation. And, and here's the thing that, that's that you know that verse, because that's the fourth verse. Yeah. He was a lawyer. Most lawyers, the most powerful part of what they say is in the concluding the argument, the closer, the right? Sum up. So if Key's ghost was like here, he'd be like, I don't know why you guys are singing the first verse. That's just my warm up. I always wanted everyone to sing the fourth verse. If you right. guys were going to actually make an anthem or something, how come you didn't make it? I'd have just written the one and that's what I would have just written that fourth one and just given you that. The story of the Star Spangled Banner just showed that Key's words and the actions that happened here really changed how Americans viewed their flag, how that caused Americans to take their flag more seriously, yeah. ingrained the flag as the quintessential symbol of the United States, so that you see Americans, that cultural bond that we have as a people, as Americans really was formed here at Fort McHenry in 1814 through the words of Francis Scott Key. So what do, what do you think about the, uh, the, the constant conversation about adapting another national anthem? You mean changing the national anthem and adopting another piece? Yes. I think people need to come here and experience the history here firsthand and learn the story firsthand. I think they change their tune. <laughs> uh, <laughs> changing the tune about changing the tune. A lot of those people, they, like for example, they'll say bombs bursting in air, you must be warlike. He was just the opposite. He opposed yeah. the War of 1812. He was a very religious man. He generally, you know, he, what he was saying was in spite of the rockets, in spite of the bombs, the flag yeah. was still there. Well, I think, I think the, uh, the other part of the argument is it's just so tough to sing. Well, I mean, for, for the average person. Well, hey, the War of 1812 was tough, and we didn't give up on it. <laughs> Going to the Transcontinental Railroad was tough. We didn't give up on it. No, we didn't. Going to the moon was tough, didn't and we didn't shy from that. And the Civil Rights Movement was tough, and we didn't shy away from that. So just because it's tough, when have we Americans ever shied away from something because it's tough? What kind of I, argument is that? I retract the question. <laughs> <laughs> I think we should make it harder. <laughs> the original Star Spangled Banner is somewhere in the Smithsonian. But there's a replica here at the fort, and Vince's unbridled passion has inspired in me a burning desire to raise the same sized flag that inspired our national anthem. You want to raise the big flag? I want to raise the big flag. He wants to raise the big flag. We get the big flag, oh, can we? He got to raise the big flag. Sure. And from what I hear, it's a big flag. We're flying a 17 by 25 foot flag right here. Now the huge one's 30 by 42 feet. It's a pretty big flag. You think it's too windy for it? Okay, so here's the deal. Look, that cruel help? Raising the flag, but we'll need every, everybody in, the, in here to help catch it when it comes down. Okay. So that's, that's the deal. All you right. guys in for that? We can so raise first, the big one, but it's a team effort. Right, we'll see if we can get some, we'll need some visitors too. So that's not, that's not the big flag? No. No, it's not. No, the big flag is a big flag. And it's like a sail. Yeah. So when he says, let go, let go, because he's been dragged into the <laughs> Sally Port, crushed his hat. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Let me get this straight. Vince got thrown into the Sally Port and his Ranger hat got crushed. Yes. Because the wind caught the flag the wrong way? Yes, and he did not let go. It'll drag you. 
<laughs> this is the kind so this of. This is going to be fun. It's the kind of thing. It's, good. We, <laughs> it's a good windy day. We'd like to see that if that's possible. So we're here in Baltimore at Fort McHenry, the birthplace of the Star Spangled Banner. On this hallowed ground, Ranger Vince and his team of historical interpreters are dedicated to bringing history to life. Be careful with that thing. Oh, you can poke your eye out. But the story of Fort McHenry is really the story of a flag, a very big flag. This is the hands-on history part of our program. And I've been given the honor of raising that big flag over the fort. And it'll come to you, trust me. But first, we've got to put the little one away. Off the ground, OK. That's 17 by 25 feet. Now, the huge one's 30 by 42 feet. That's a big flag. Mike, you want to do this? I'd be honored. Well, come on down. A lot of traditions surround the American flag. One of the oldest is the unique way we fold it. Mm -hmm. Fold the flag in the shape of a triangle. Yep. So in the flag, do you know why? <sighs> in deference to the ancient pyramids? Some say, some say that the triangle is symbolic of the three-cornered hats ah. worn by the founding fathers. Right. Others maintain it's for the constitution that calls for a balance of power between three branches of government. Interesting. Some say it's like a religious thing. Father, you know? son, holy ghost, That's right. the holy trinity. Others, right, right? Um, masons say that it's a Masonic symbol, you know, the pyramid with the eyeball in the middle of right, it. Right, right. So a lot of symbolism. Um, the federal government never had a law that said why in the code it said for the founding fathers but I think it was left kind of open so that Americans could put their own meaning into it you know what I mean sure so with the small flag packed away it's time to go big this is a big flag changing the flag you know somebody's got to do it got to be done Vince so both sides want to back away and unroll backing away and sir, all the way down. steady okay Okay. The commander of the fort, Major George Armistead, said it's my intention to have a flag so large the British would have no difficulty seeing it from a distance. Okay, now that they have the flag open, uh, let's go ahead and we want to turn the flag around clockwise. There we go, now we're set. All right, here we go, guys. I'm going to start to yank. Ready? Pull away! All right, here we go. <laughs> oh, how much does this thing weigh? About 55 pounds. Seems heavier. As soon as they let go of it, you'll, you'll feel lighter for you. Let her get... <laughs> Pull away. Keep hauling. Yeah. Oh. You're doing great. Oh, my God. That's there a big you flag. Go. <laughs> 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 really big flag. There you go. Huzzah! Now what? Go move. <laughs> Look at that thing go. Look at that. Isn't that awesome? That is awesome. That's a workout. Yeah. Freedom's heavy. <laughs> it is. You could use that if you want. Freedom's heavy, yeah. Please address the lens and in your own words, say something unforgettable about Baltimore, make people want to come visit, and bring history alive. It's only you can do, Vince. Well, I would say, you know, the, the tagline for Baltimore is the birthplace of the Star Spangled Banner, Baltimore, the Star Spangled City. Connect to your country up close and personal through a visit to Fort McHenry and a visit to Baltimore. I have nothing to add, except thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. It's great fun. Isn't this awesome? Good luck getting that thing down. <laughs> <laughs> and in Dahlia will bow. Here's the thing about my hometown. Baltimore has a chip on its shoulder. Boston and Philly and New York get all the attention in American history classes, but without the brave stand made here in this harbor, our country wouldn't have made it out of the 19th century. That's why I care so much about this 18th century song that eventually became our national anthem. And that's why a park ranger becomes an almost terrifyingly intense evangelist. So why is it that of the 154 million objects stored in the Smithsonian Institution, that the Star Spangled Banner is considered the most valued? Because of Baltimore, baby. That's right, Baltimore.